Now, that is quite the collector's item. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today, we're counting down our picks for the top 20 shocking Pawn Stars discoveries. For this list, we'll be looking at some of the most shocking and amazing items to ever make their way onto Pawn Stars. Number 20, Jimi Hendrix Guitar. American made Fender Stratocaster. This guitar was actually played by Jimi Hendrix. That's a big wow factor right there. The Pawn Stars love them some guitars, and in this episode, they hit upon a big one. A man came in claiming that he had Jimi Hendrix's 1963 Fender Stratocaster, a guitar that Hendrix played in the studio. If this was actually owned and played by the legend himself. This will be the coolest guitar ever to walk into my shop. They quickly discovered its legitimacy through the serial number, and the appraiser valued the guitar at a whopping $1 million. Now that's one expensive guitar. Rick offered the owner $450,000 before working up to an offer of $600,000. Six? I can't do it, man. However, the owner wasn't willing to part with anything less than a cool mill, and Rick lost out on a piece of rock history. You want to come to a fair point in selling something of great value? Don't be desperate about it. And that I am not. Number 19, 1715 Spanish Fleet Coin. During the second season of Pawn Stars, a man walked into the shop with an old gold coin that had been inherited from his grandfather. Coins back then were weird. The size didn't have to be exactly correct. It just had to have the right amount of gold the right weight and the right purity. The coin was dated from 1715 and was just one small part of a large hall containing over 14 million pesos of silver and gold. And in this corner, there's an L, that means Lima, Peru, Mint. Eight is the denomination, biggest gold coin the Spanish made. The ship was making its way from Havana to Spain when it was struck by a hurricane and sunk off the coast of Florida. I would put a price tag you have 18,000 on it. Okay. The owner's particular gold coin was in exceptional condition, and he asked for $2,000, but the gold expert pegged it around $18,000. An agreement was quickly struck for a solid $11,000, which was $9,000 more than what the owner expected. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's like finding treasure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Number 18. Dana Chura Facilium. Dana Chura Facilium is a scientific text on rocks and minerals, written by George Bauer and also called Georgius Agricola, which was published in 1546. It was the first sediment based scientific text since Pliny the Elder published his natural history in AD 77. I don't know what the book is worth, but if it did belong to Isaac Newton, it should be worth thousands. It's certainly a special find by itself, but what made this particular copy even more special is that it was owned by none other than Sir Isaac Newton. What's the book about? Uh, it's about geology and mining that Newton was very much into. It doesn't look like it's in English. Uh, it's in uh, Latin. A special book plate certified that it was indeed owned by Newton and stored in his personal library. This number here, J9-S7, is Newton's shelf number where he would have stored the book. The appraiser gave the book a rough value of $20,000, but the owner ended up letting it go for a measly $7,000 in what may be one of the worst deals in Pawn Stars history. Number 17, 17th century ship bell. Rick is a sucker for shipwreck items, so when a woman brought in an antique ship bell belonging to the Dutch East India Company, he was in pawn shop heaven. This is my 1602 shipwreck Dutch East India Company bell. Despite Rick's enthusiasm, the old man had doubts regarding its validity, as he thought the bell was in too good shape. I don't think this thing was in salt water for any period of time to mount to anything. He believed that a genuine bell that had been in salt water for an extended period of time would be far more degraded. However, an expert stated that the ship likely crashed in shallow water and that the bell was never actually submerged. 90% of all shipwrecks are in shallow water. In fact, most of them are sticking up. You know, they hit yeah. the reef and they pretty much stay there. The bell's genuine. He ended up valuing the antique bell at $15,000. Number 16, 1961 Les Paul SG Guitar. Les Paul was a pioneer of the electric guitar, and his eponymous guitars are both wickedly popular and stylish. Les Paul's more or less a legend. Basically, everything about a modern electric guitar was invented by him. Paul was married to Mary Ford, and the two had 16 top 10 hits as husband and wife musical duo, Les Paul and Mary Ford. 
Ford's nephew brought in a custom 1961 Gibson SG, and because it had personal history with Paul and Ford, its value was significantly inflated. Dude, this is amazing. I, I can't even believe I'm holding this in my hands. The guitar expert, Jesse Amoroso, was blown away by the find, and honored to hold a piece of musical history, eventually valuing the guitar at a whopping $150,000. I, I mean, I don't really have any doubts on this guitar. This is history, dude. It's easily a six-figure guitar. After some back and forth, the owner walked away with a check for 90000 Number 15, 1922 High Relief Peace Dollar. High Relief Matte Finish Coin. Where did you get this? I won it at a poker game. You never know what you'll win in a poker game. A man came into the shop asking 20000 for a fancy coin he had won in a poker game. A coin expert identified the coin as a legitimate 1922 high-relief peace dollar, which according to him is one of the rarest coins in American history. The 1922 high-relief peace dollar is one of the rarest coins in American history. He then valued the coin between $50,000 and $100,000, which, if you're good at math, you'll realize is a little more than $20,000. The man eventually sold the peace dollar to Rick for $80,000, which is a little on the low side, apparently. But hey, we wouldn't complain about earning $80,000. Meet me in the middle at 80, and you got a deal. It's a deal. All right. OK. Number 14, Gibson SJ200 Master Museum Guitar. A man walked into the shop claiming to have the most beautiful acoustic guitar, and it certainly is beautiful. And this was actually the very first Master Museum. This is serial number one. The Master Museum series is a collection of acoustic guitars, really high end, really ornate. The guitar is a custom Gibson SJ200 built by a man named Ren Ferguson. This particular guitar is the very first Master Museum, serial number one. The owner was asking for a surprisingly low $50,000, and in came guitar expert Jesse Amoroso to take a look. Wow, sounds as good as it looks. Yes, it does. <laughs> this is as good as it gets. This is the Rolex presidential of, of, of Gibson guitars. He called the guitar the Rolex presidential of Gibson guitars and valued it between $50,000 and $60,000, owing to its historical importance. I'm hesitant even to drop to 48. I, I really don't want to move for my price. The owner, who proudly stood firm in his valuation of $50,000, reluctantly let it go for $48,000. Number 13, The Book of Mormon. Here, a fellow walks into the shop with a piece of American history, the Book of Mormon. This is a version that was printed actually in 1842. This one wasn't printed in many copies, maybe 600 something copies. So I was gonna ask something on the order of like $25,000 for it. Damn. The book was first published by a Joseph Smith in 1830, and Adam's fifth edition copy was printed in 1842. According to the customer, it was also the last edition published in Joseph Smith's lifetime, as he died in June of 1844. The Book of Mormon is not just a book of theology, it's really a book that talks about the American experience. This is the fifth edition, and this was the last one that was actually printed in Joseph Smith's lifetime. As Rick said, it's not just an important religious manuscript, but one of the most valuable pieces of American literature. The appraiser, Rebecca Romney of Bowman Rare Books, valued the book at $40,000, making it the most valuable book that had ever been appraised by Rebecca. I would appraise this book actually at about $40,000. Oh. Adam walked away with $24,000, only one grand less than what he was originally asking. You gave me an extra thousand last time. This time I'll give it to you, so we'll do okay. it that way. It's a deal. When Rebecca said $40,000, I felt it was like, maybe like Joseph Smith when he found the plates. Hallelujah. Number 12, 1932 Lincoln Convertible V12. I have a 1932 Lincoln Convertible V12. Yeah, the cast of Pawn Stars loves them some guitars, but they really love them some cars. A man known as Uncle Phil offered the men of the pawn shop a 1932 Lincoln Convertible V12, a fancy car that included the Lincoln L head V12 engine. It's crazy that Lincoln made this badass ride at the height of the Great Depression. It could produce up to an impressive 150 horsepower which for the era was quite impressive, and it competed with the Cadillac V12 in its day. And to think, this baby was manufactured during the Great Depression. It's a luxury car, which according to Rick, can fetch up to $170,000, provided it's in mint condition. In perfect condition, this could sell as high as 170 grand at auction. However, the car had a few minor imperfections, so Rick managed to snag it for $95,000. We could do gold. We take 95? Okay. 
All right. Okay. Number 11, ancient coin. Anything from the ancient period is sure to fetch a pretty penny, even their pretty pennies. A woman walked in with an ancient coin, stating that she had picked it up at an estate sale without really knowing what it was. Um, he was a king and he conquered a bunch of land. The coin is a King of Pontus coin, bearing the image of Mithridates VI. Also known as Mithridates the Great for his military prowess, he served as King of Pontus and Armenia Minor from 120 to 63 BCE. He was descended on his mother's side from Greek kings like Alexander, and on his father's side from Persian kings. The owner was asking $15,000 for the ancient coin, but the appraiser valued it as just $10,000. Rick offered the woman $5,000, but she rejected the offer and decided to shop around, promising to return if she failed to find a buyer. If I still have it in a month or two, would you still be willing to buy it at that time? Yeah, as long as the world hasn't come to an end or anything like that, yeah. Sounds right. good. Well, have a nice day. Thank you. Number 10, Egyptian mummy mask. Egyptian mummies and mummy fashionings are renowned the world over, often posing as major museum pieces. But some make their way to pawn shops. How old is it? It is believed to be from second century AD. This thing is almost 2,000 years old and it's in amazing shape. A man brought in an authentic Egyptian cartonage mummy mask, complete with the original coloring. It's a gorgeous piece of work dated from 2100 BCE, and the seller claimed that he would take between $30,000 and $70,000 for it. Here's the deceased riding on the back of a lion. That would only happen with a royal person. So, is it real? From what I can see, this is real. An expert who looks like he came straight from Jumanji was invited to the shop and valued the piece at $20,000, greatly disappointing the owner. However, he got one over on Corey after some tense back and forth, securing his goal of $30,000. All right, you want 30 for it? I'll do 30 right now. Right now? Right now, I'm, it's ready? $30,000. $30,000. My man, you got a deal. All right, deal. Number nine, 16th century Spanish gold bar. The pawn stars see a lot of gold, like the time four one kilogram gold bars with a value of nearly $130,000 were brought into the shop. But one of the most interesting pieces of gold that they've aired has to be a Spanish gold bar from the 1500s. The owner literally found the gold bar hiding away in an attic and discovered that it belonged to a 1554 shipwreck off the coast of Texas. The melted down value of the gold was $24,000, although the bar in its current historical state was valued at $50,000. Rick eventually handed over $35,000 for the bar, a comfortable spot between its meltdown and historical value. Number 8. 1961 Fender Stratocaster You may not know the name Vic Flick, but the man has been around. Flick was a studio musician from the late 50s to the early 80s who played with the likes of Nancy Sinatra and Tom Jones. I've worked on records with uh, Nancy Sinatra and Petula Clark, Tom Jones, it's not unusual. All right. So were you like a studio mus musician? I was, I was, from 1958 till about 1983. Perhaps his main claim to fame is that he played the famous guitar riff on the original James Bond theme. <laughs> So yeah, you know his work. In this episode, he was selling his 1961 Fender Stratocaster, which was valued at $70,000. According to the appraiser, that specific guitar can be heard on a lot of popular songs from the 60s and 70s, perhaps more than we even think. You've heard this guitar probably more times than you even realize. You've heard this particular guitar. Probably true, yeah. Yeah. So what do you think it's worth? Easily $60,000, $70,000. Vic was happy to walk away with $55,000, saying he and his wife would pop out for a beer or two to celebrate. I knew he'd probably go for fifty-five, dollars and I'm happy. Now I've got the money in my back pocket, I think the wife and I will just pop out for a beer or two and celebrate the occasion. Number seven, George Washington suit. Drum roll. Whoa. Yeah. So is this George Washington's too? It is. Season 15 saw one of the greatest items in Pawn Stars history, a suit worn by none other than George Washington. The silk suit is from the mid 18th century and was originally pink in color before time did its thing and washed out all the dye. Back then it was pink and you could still see some of the pink in this area. At the time, pink was a fashionable color that signified success and luxury. As you can imagine, a suit worn by George Washington will fetch a bit of money. And the seller was asking three million. So how much? 
uh, I wouldn't sell for less than $3 million. That was, however, a little too much for Rick, who offered $2 million before bowing out. Maybe now the seller can sell or donate the suit to a museum, where it should have been all along. Since we're friends, I would, the best price, absolute best price would be two and a half million. Okay, and you're firm with that? Absolutely firm with that. I mean, okay, well, I guess the suit's out then. Number six, the O.J. Simpson Bronco. It is the O.J. Bronco. Are you kidding me? I've never seen anything quite like this. The image of a white Ford Bronco became a piece of American history on the afternoon of June 17, 1994, when Simpson and Al Cowlings entered into a low-speed chase with the police after a warrant was issued for Simpson's arrest. Nearly 25 years later, that very same Bronco wound up on Pawn Stars. The seller, who was OJ's agent at the time, states that he had previously turned down an offer of $500,000 and asked Rick for $1.3 million. How much you want for this? A million three. Um, yeah, think about it. It's a one of a kind. However, Rick thought buying the Bronco was too much of a gamble and passed, telling the seller that he should take the SUV to an auction. I'm gonna pass on it? Okay. With something like this, it's so much of a gamble because there's nothing to compare it to its price. Right. I'll never sell the Bronco for under a million dollars. I know it's worth that, and if it's not, it will be. Number five, Harry Houdini's straight jacket. Houdini is perhaps the most famous illusionist and stunt performer in history. With his name being basically synonymous with magic, he was renowned in the early 20th century for his thrilling escape acts, which included freeing himself from a straight jacket. One of these straight jackets was brought into the shop by a man asking for a hefty $100,000. Theo Houdini was notorious for selling things that were supposed to belong to Houdini that didn't belong to Houdini. He claims that the jacket was given to him by his grandfather, who was a good friend of Houdini's brother, Theodore Hardeen. This caused some consternation with Rick, who claims that Theodore would often sell things supposedly, but not actually, belonging to his brother. Swan felt Tent and Awning Company. I thought for sure there was no way we could prove this was Houdini's, and now we have a positive clue. It proved to be the real deal and was valued at roughly $40,000, but the owner walked away after Rick offered $25,000. You know, I think I'll keep it. Okay. I'm always here, man. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Forget the numbers. The most exciting thing is to actually have uh, the expert come in and find an actual photograph of Harry Houdini wearing my jacket. Absolutely blew me away. Blew me away. Number four, D.B. Cooper Bill. D.B. Cooper is one of the most famous thieves of all time. He hijacked a Boeing 727 in 1971, extorting the modern equivalent of $1.2 million before parachuting out of the airplane. Cooper's fame comes from the fact that he's never been identified or captured, making this the only unsolved case of air piracy. You have a piece of a $20 bill. It is a piece of a $20 bill from the D.B. Cooper hijacking. However, various ransom bills have been found and collected, and a small piece of one eventually made its way onto Pawn Stars. The initials that are on this bill are actually the FBI agent who was cataloging all the pieces of the bills. And I've got a certificate of authenticity. The owner was looking to flip $20 into $2,000, but ended up getting $1,600 instead. Less than what he wanted, and far less than what Cooper potentially walked away with back in 1971. Number three, JFK's humidor. I have John F. Kennedy's cigar box he used in the White House. JFK was a bit of a cigar aficionado, among other things, and Rick was lucky enough to come face to face with his personal cigar box. Included in the package was the humidor itself, as well as eight individually wrapped cigars. The box contains 11 hand rolled cigars wrapped in clear plastic. What do we got there? Eight, there's a few missing. So someone smoked three of the cigars. Not me. That's how I got it. According to the official document written by JFK's secretary, the humidor was given to the president as a birthday present on May 29th, 1962, just 18 months before he was assassinated. This is one of those once in a lifetime items. If I let this thing walk out the door, I'm never gonna see another one like it. The seller was asking for a relatively meager $95,000, but walked away with just 60,000. How much are you asking? Well, as you know, the other comparable one went for half a million bucks or so. I need some quick cash or else I would just put that in an auction and get 150, 200 grand, whatever it's gonna go for. Mm. I'll give it to you for 95,000. 
We're not experts or anything, but that seems like a really small amount for such a personal piece of history. I took 60, it's fine, because if I would've put it in an auction, I would've had to wait about six months. We need money now to get this new facility, so I'm good. Number two, the Beatles' original contract. I actually got one of the most important documents in rock and roll history. The contract between Brian Epstein, who was the manager, and the Beatles creating the partnership between the two of them. When it comes to the most important pieces of musical history, the Beatles' original contract is pretty freaking high on the list. The seller put it nicely when he called it the holy grail of rock and roll. The contract was between the Beatles and their manager Brian Epstein, and it stated that Epstein would receive 25% of all Beatles royalties. Brian Epstein was a genius. He basically transformed the Beatles from an unknown band playing small clubs into the biggest rock band ever. When he died, he couldn't be replaced, and it played a large role in the Beatles breaking up. Epstein served as a major influence on the Beatles' image and popularity, and was even referred to as the fifth Beatle before he died of an accidental sleeping pill overdose in 1967. Despite the seller asking for $1 million, it was professionally valued at $500,000. There's no question that this is genuine. I'd put the value of this piece right at around $500,000. Rick pounced and offered just $350,000, and the seller was forced to walk away. I would go $350,000. That's cash right now. If you don't take that, I would wait for another auction. Um, I'm going to have to decline on the three fifty. dollars Good luck with it. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. Before we unveil our number one pick, here are some honorable mentions. 1932 Ford Roadster, a gorgeous vintage car reluctantly goes for $68,250. I feel like a sardine in this thing. You'll be hard pressed to find any other Roadster like this. It's gonna break my heart to get rid of it, but things change. 2001 Super Bowl ring. This 14 karat white gold and diamond ring was bought for 2000, but is now worth $100,000. It's 14 karat white gold, I think there's 143 diamonds, and they use sapphire and rubies for the logo. 2014 Hertz Penske GT Mustang. Only 150 six-speed manual transition Mustangs were built, and this one went for $60,000. I think it's hard to, it's hard to say because it's, it's rare, right? There's not many of these cars for sale. But I think the fact that this is uh, one of the first 10 cars that were built and wasn't rented, it has that six-speed manual, I think that's got to add some kind of value. 1915 Panorama Pacific Octagonal Gold Coin. A trip to Florida results in a $67,500 deal for a rare coin. In 1915, uh, San Francisco hosted the Panama Pacific Exposition to celebrate the opening of the Panama Canal. And to help celebrate the opening, the U.S. Mint struck a variety of coins in silver and gold. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, 3,000 ounces of silver. I got some 90% silver dimes over here, some quarters. I got these bars, and this thing alone is almost 75 pounds. It's not often that 3,000 ounces of silver comes through your door, but make hay while the sun shines, right? Jeff, the owner of the silver, wheeled 3,372 ounces of silver into the shop, causing the old man to practically leap from his desk so he could inspect the glorious find. I've never seen you get up from your desk that quick. I always get up, son. Not generally very Move quick. My hand. Included in the collection were bags of dimes and quarters, numerous silver bars, and a 75-pound brick of pure silver. After doing some headache-inducing math, Rick discovers that the pile was worth about $111,000, which Jeff was happy to accept. You got $46,000 for the coins, $33,390 for these bars right here. 32.39 times 942 equals... So we got a total of... $110,901. Turns out silver is a pretty good investment. Now, if only we had 3,000 ounces of silver laying around. I'm really glad my dad taught me to invest, because today I'm walking out with over $100,000. I'm going to take one of these, Rick. Um, no, no, you're not. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.